Welcome to the 2021 Watershed Congress. This is Thursday, September 23rd, day four of our virtual Watershed Congress week, and we're happy that you're joining us once again today. Uh, the Watershed Congress is uh, organized by the Delaware Riverkeeper Network in collaboration with many other organizations. My name is Cherry Town. I'm Director of Grants and Operations with the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. I'm also your moderator for today's session, your Thursday Bright Spot. Um, our first presentation team includes Elizabeth R. She is a youth volunteer at the Stroud Water Research Center. Uh, uh, Elizabeth is not able to join us today, um, at least not right at this moment. She may have a chance to um, connect in later. David Bressler, also with Stroud Water Research Center, works with watershed groups in the Delaware River Basin to help build capacity to monitor and detect changes in stream conditions. And, and Patty Haug is uh, with Brownfield Science and Technology, Inc. Their talk is titled Targeted Longitudinal Monitoring of a Small Watershed in the Borough of Westchester, PA to Explain Elevated Conductivity and Identify Patterns in Freshwater Salinization. Okay, thanks, Cherry. Um, I'm going to introduce Elizabeth since Elizabeth is not able to make it because of the storm, she's stuck in school. Um, Elizabeth is a senior at Conestoga High School in Berwyn, Pennsylvania. She um, has been working on this particular stream in Westchester for the last several months doing monitoring over the summer. Uh, Patty and I pretty much advised Elizabeth on this and provided her with the study design and she executed it and prepared a report and this um, presentation as well as some other uh, documents. Um, her, the work on this is part of a broader effort to look at uh, five different streams in the Westchester area. And so I will leave it at that and allow um, Cherry, I guess, will begin the presentation. I hope there you are well today. My name is Elizabeth Brushman, and I will be presenting on my targeted longitudinal monitoring in Westchester, Pennsylvania. She described patterns in freshwater salinization as indicated by elevated chloride um, and conductivity levels. I'm a senior at Conestoga High School and have had three years of rigorous college science experience. Um, in March of 2021, I shadowed Patty Haug, a master watershed steward and recent uh, Westchester University graduate student at the continuous monitoring station at the East Branch of Plum Run. From there, I learned of Patty's work of monitoring five various uh, streams in Westchester. I'm following up on that research and studying the East Branch of Plum Run in more detail. The continuous monitoring station has uh, recorded median values of approximately 620 microsiemens per centimeter. And this is appreciably higher than the 78.6 microsiemens per centimeter um, of the natural predicted value in Olson and Cormier 2019. Thus, under the supervision of David Bressler and Patty Hogg in conjunction with the Stroud Center, I tested 13 locations, all except one were upstream of the continuous monitoring station. The goal was to try and determine sources of the elevated conductivity and determine if freshwater salinization was the reason for the high conductivity. My hypothesis was that the upstream urban land uses, roads, and other paved surfaces were contaminating stream water with salt as it flowed into the forested Gordon natural area. The continuous monitoring station alongside a map of the Westchester borough are pictured here. And this image includes um, the actual watershed and an image of the um, continuous monitoring station close up and the sensor. Here, the watershed is overlaid with the approximate locations of the site. Um, and a relative and a description of the location. For example, station two is a road crossing between Jeffries and Church Road. I measured chloride and conductivity at road and pedestrian crossings, tributaries and other junctions along the stream at base flow conditions. It was important to measure at base flow, um, which is when the conductivity is at its resting levels and is not diluted by stormwater or spiking because of abnormal inputs. I measured chloride and conductivity on nine different days from June 14th to June 25th at 13 sites. In order to carry this out, I used hatch quantab titrators measuring chloride in milligrams per liter and a calibrated HANA DIS-3 measuring conductivity in microsiemens per centimeter and temperature in degrees Celsius. 
And in order to sample, I viewed the continuous monitoring station on monitor my watershed. If the values were in a 50 microsiemen per centimeter range from the baseline of 650 microsiemens per centimeter, then it was deemed appropriate for sampling. Rain is a major cause of disruption to the baseline. And for that reason, on June 15th and June 20th, samples were not taken. It is typically expected that rain dilutes the stream, but after rain on June 20th, there seemed to be an abnormal conductivity spike. And from this study, four key conclusions were found as exhibited here. This graph of conductivity illustrates the decreasing trend of conductivity um, as samples were taken downstream. The red indicates the highest levels, while the orange is slightly less, and the yellow indicates the lowest. Notice that all levels far exceed predicted natural levels. So diving in closer to the data, it's obvious that anthropogenic factors have significantly altered the ionic composition of the stream, as the predicted value of Olsen and Cormier 2019 of 78.6 is appreciably lower than the smallest conductivity value. This value and the EPA um, natural reference sites 75th percentile value of 297.8 microsiemens per centimeter are plotted on this graph to illustrate this discrepancy. And from my understanding, this trend holds true for chloride as well. Red indicates values over Pennsylvania's drinking water standard of 250 milligrams per liter and the EPA's chronic chloride exposure criterion of 230 milligrams per liter. Orange indicates the chronic chloride criterion of Michigan, while yellow is the recommendation of Maryland's Department of Natural Resources, and green is considered to um, be the chloride values that a healthy stream would consist of. And here, um, the median chloride values are exhibited on a graph alongside the aforementioned bounds. So how does conductivity relate to chloride? The pattern shown in my study here confirms that high conductivity is most likely due to chloride, as conductivity and chloride have a direct strong correlation as exhibited by the top left graph. Urban land cover was provided by the services of Monomai Watershed, and it appears that there is a positive correlation between that and both specific conductivity and chloride, but the correlation is a tad weaker. Fortunately, I was given access to a Westchester University graduate study containing measurements of conductivity along the East Branch of Plum Run. The two sites, most identical in location, are used on this table, and the study's values are compared to the median values of my findings. It was found that the conductivity values of the headwater increased by 116%, while Station 8, which is situated in the tributary, had a conductivity increase of 134%. From the data presented in this study, the watershed also experienced more development over these last 15 years. To emphasize, the tributary preserved in the Gordon Natural Area appears to be significantly affected by outside urbanization due to its unexpectedly high conductivity and chloride values. And despite its forested location, the groundwater seems to be contaminated with salt. The result confirms the hypothesis that the urban land use roads and other paved surfaces are most likely contributing um, to freshwater salinization in this watershed. Conductivity and chloride were highly correlated with each other and with the amount of uh, upstream urban land use. This work also indicates that salinization is happening quickly in this watershed. This is not surprising. Freshwater salinization is happening across the country and is threatening not only ecological integrity of watersheds, but also drinking water. Additional steps can be taken to further understand the, ex the extent of the stream's impairment. For one, the toxicity of chloride can be influenced by the presence of sulfate, the hardness of the stream, and the presence of ions like sodium, calcium, or magnesium. Therefore, measuring these quantities um, can help us understand the extent of the salt contamination and the toxicity to the biota. Additionally, freshwater salinization has also been proven to increase the alkalinity of streams. So pH should also be tested for to confirm this trend for this particular stream. And to further evaluate potential point source solutions, the soil at the marshy headwaters can also be tested for presence of chloride. 
So what can we do to slow the pace of this freshwater salinization? The main goal is reducing the amount of salt used in the winter and to devote more funds and efforts to developing tools that like um, more efficient snow plows, strategic application of brines and geothermal resources to melt the snow or remove snow without having to use salt. Westchester University is already using uh, geothermal resources on its uh, campus's sidewalk. In general, um, leaders should try to support better development practices that focus more on watershed health. Thank you for listening to my presentation. You can contact uh, Dee Bressler at stroudcenter.org if you have any questions. So that was our first uh, lightning talk. And again, as uh, you just heard, we're gonna be taking questions after all three of our talks have been presented. So now we're gonna to turn to Zachary Smith, as in his, who is in his senior year at Drexel University studying environmental science and Lauren McGrath, Director of Watershed Protection Programs at Willistown Conservation Trust. Their talk is Counting Microplastics in Headwater Streams, a Low-Cost Methodology. Zach and Lauren, over to you. Hello, everybody. I am Zach Smith, a senior at Drexel University, um, and I'm gonna pull up the video for you guys to watch. Um, one second, please. Hello, I am Zach Smith from Willistown Conservation Trust, and I am a co-op in the Watershed Protection Program. Um, and alongside my supervisor, Lauren McGrath, this year we worked with a low-cost and plastic-free methodology to count microplastics in the headwaters of Ridley Crumb and Darby Creeks. Willistown Conservation Trust is a certified land trust program organization in Chester and Delaware counties um, throughout the Ridley Crumb and Darby Creek watersheds. Here at the trust, we're home to a bird program, stewardship program, land protection program, watershed protection program, and rest and farm. And here at the watershed protection program, our goal is to ensure the long-term health of our streams through monitoring restoration and best management practices. One of the things we monitor for um, are microplastics in our headwater streams. And this project started back in 2020 when we assessed um, samples, historic samples from March 2019 to March 2020. Um, and these samples were total suspended solid samples that kind of were filtered and then stored. And we looked at them after the fact for microplastic contamination. And we found 4,500 microplastics and 171 liters of water. But it's worth noting that all of these samples were collected and processed with plastic materials um, from the plastic containers they were collected in and with um, distilled water and rinsed with distilled water and stored in plastic bins. So in 2021, we went through and we removed plastic where we could while keeping it affordable. And we came up with a new methodology um, that kind of removes plastic from all aspects of the equation. And it's also worth noting that we introduced a new sample location at Rushton Woods Preserve. It's a early on low order um, headwater spring that has very low flow, but is very close to its source. And we wanted to see what microplastic contamination looked like in a stream like that, because everything else that we do is, well, headwater, um, higher order and no first order streams. So this year, we're using one liter glass ball jars because they're so readily available and very affordable. Um, we distill our own water using a plastic free water distiller. We have glass fiber filters that are plastic free. We have a vacuum pump. Um, and all samples are covered with aluminum foil and then stored in aluminum tins, also covered in foil, um, when they're not actively being um, filtered or assessed for microplastic pollution. And when we assess the microplastics, we use a 35 times magnification dissecting microscope. Um, and another thing we're really proud of this year is the fact that we're going through and pre-assessing all of our filters for existing microplastic contamination. Um, these filters come from a factory and they're stored in boxes and plastic containers. So there's likely plastic contamination on it. And we don't want the, this contamination to elevate our counts and give us a false understanding of what are in the streams. So we kind of count these and we subtract them from the final count to kind of get a truer picture of what's truly in the water sample. Um, and then the jars that we use are also thoroughly washed and dried to ensure um, cleanliness before sampling. So we just use soap, water, and rinse with distilled water before um, bringing them into the field. And here's a video on collecting a sample. Um, and this video, we're in Crumb Creek at Kirkwood Preserve, just collecting a small one liter grab sample of microplastics. Hi everyone. 
everyone. I'm Zach Smith from Willstown Conservation Trust. I'm a co-op in the Watershed Protection Department with Lauren McGrath. And I'm here standing at Crumbs Creek at Kirkwood Preserve today to show you guys how I'm going to sample some microplastics to determine what the pollution levels look like in our headwater streams. So the watershed protection team, the general rule of thumb for when we're sampling and collecting water is don't trample where you sample. And it pretty much just means don't walk where you're going to be collecting grab samples. Because if you do, if I'm walking all up right in front of where I'm trying to sample upstream, I can suspend microplastics and sediments into the water column where they float downstream. If I've already trampled where I'm going to sample, that can get collected in the jar. So when we go and analyze it, we can see unrealistically high representations of sediment and microplastics. Um, and we don't want to see that. We want a true picture of what's happening in the stream when we collect. So we go to collect the grab sample as most upstream point of activity at the sample location. So now we're going to sample for microplastics. And to start, we want to make sure we triple rinse our glass jar. Back at the Russian Conservation Center, we do extensively wash our jars to make sure that between sample months, um, everything is removed from them and any old samples are washed out. But that doesn't mean they're perfect, and we want to kind of pre-rinse with the stream water to make sure that any old contamination is out and it's flushed with this water from concrete. So I'm going to go ahead and triple rinse this jar, um, and then we'll move on to the next step. You just want to give it a nice little shake, and then we always dump it right behind us. That way we're not putting new or any dirty water where we're already trying to sample. And we do this three times just to make sure that we're rinsing out anything um, that might get dislodged the first or second time. Um, if we do it once, we might not get everything out, so just be extra careful. And that was three times. So now that we have a clean triple rinse jar, I'm going to go and collect a sample for microplastics. To start, we want to make sure the lid is off of the jar so that we can allow water to flow into the jar. And we're going to go and we're going to face upstream and make sure that we're not going to sample where you've already trampled so we don't get extra microplastics or sediment in the sample. Um, and then I always face the jar directly down with the mouth facing the bed of the stream. So we're just going to go down, we're going to bend down with the jar still facing straight away from us down as far as possible without disturbing any sediments on the bottom of the stream. We're going to slowly bring the jar up through the water column, facing it upstream to allow water to flow in because we want to get a representation of everything that is within the water column. Um, and then we're also going to just cap it as soon as possible. So as you saw, I just, right when the jar was at the surface, I popped the lid on. And now it's because we don't want any atmospheric deposition to deposit microplastics onto the sample because the atmosphere is not within the stream and we're just solely wondering what is in the stream at the moment of sampling um, so that reduces any other potential contamination. So after we collect the sample, we bring it back to the Russian Conservation Center and store it in a refrigerator before it is filtered through the um, filters that have already been counted um, in the vacuum pump that we have. So um, after everything is filtered, we just have to identify the microplastics. And to do that, we use the microscope. Um, so the filter samples are dried overnight um, at 100 degrees Fahrenheit in an oven before placing in a desiccator for two hours. And then once that is done, um, the trays are individually put under a microscope and assessed manually for microplastic contamination. Um, and when we're identifying plastics, we're just counting them to get a count of what is there. Um, and we're sorting them by shape and color. So shapes include fibers, fragments, beads, films, and others. And then for um, colors, we use blue, red, green, yellow, black, um, and clear. And then we have other, just in case there's something that doesn't fall under one of those categories. But here on the right, you can see a few different microplastics that we've seen this year. Um, the photo on the left has a microfiber, um, a blue microfiber that can be bent and kind of manipulated with forceps. And right beside it um, is just filamentous vegetation that broke easily when the forceps touched it. Um, so that kind of, if something is in question, it kind of looks like a microplastic, just manipulating it um, and seeing how it reacts can tell you whether it is a plastic or not. All the way to the right, you see just another blue microfiber. Um, and then the second most common type of plastic we saw this year were plastic fragments. Um, so the center photo up top is just a white fragment that we saw um, in the spring on Rushton Woods Preserve. And then below that is just another fragment that clearly doesn't look like a fiber, but isn't um, necessarily round like a bead. So that just gets filtered and sorted under fragments. Um, so what we've seen 
we've seen an incredible decrease in microplastic counts from between last year and this year. This year's counts, um, we're averaging about 5.4 microplastics per liter of sample water um, compared to 26.8 using the um, data from 2020. So clearly removing plastic from the sampling methodology did make an incredible um, difference. And you see a huge decrease across the board in this graph on the right. Um, and it's just worth noting that Rushton Wood Spring did not have any um, collection in the 2020 study, but everything else decreased um, greatly. And it's also worth noting that 100% of the study sites and the samples that we collected did have microplastic contamination. So let's just kind of know that this is a watershed wide problem, not just a downstream problem, and that here in the headwaters, we're also facing this pressure of microplastic pollution, um, and that it can kind of build up as you get downstream. So what's happening here is very, very important for what's happening downstream. And also, um, this might not come as a surprise to some, but microfibers consist of 87% of the total microplastics that we saw, um, and in fragments made up 9% of the sample. Um, the abundance of microfibers was the same as last year. We also saw 87% last year. Um, and this may not come as a shock because fibers are commonly suspended in the water column. Um, other studies have seen this and it's kind of what we saw here. So it's good to know that what we're seeing is not out of the blue. Um, and then it's also worth noting that Ashbridge Preserve, one of our um, preserves, saw 100% of the um, microplastics that were sampled, they were um, microfibers. And this is just downstream of a wastewater treatment plant, so it kind of makes sense. Um, other studies that have been done have kind of found that sites right downstream of treatment plants tend to be heavily um, fibers. Um, so yeah, that was worth noting. And then at West Branch Crump Creek, we only saw 79% of the total samples from this year uh, were microfibers. And this was the lowest count we saw, but also it makes up almost 80% of the sample. So fibers are just dominating across the board. Um, and then for next steps, we're going to continue um, collecting microplastic samples as part of our monthly water quality, water quality sampling program. Um, so we can build a long-term data set and understand what is happening long-term and I guess spatially as well um, across seasons and across watersheds with microplastics as development happens and as different things happens within the watershed. Um, we might add sites depending on different points of interest, and then also it's been tossed around to develop this into a citizen science project due to its low cost and um, the accessible methodology that we have. Glass jars are easy to come by, filter pumps are easy to come by, and a lot of labs have them. Um, and it's just a very easy methodology from start to finish to kind of understand what is happening in the headwaters, um, regardless of background. So yes, thank you for listening, and I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thanks, Zach. Um, we and, and Lauren. Um, so we're again, we're going to hold questions. Make sure if you have questions, go ahead right now. Think about putting them in the Q&A feature. Um, we're going to want to make sure we come back uh, and, and speak to uh, uh, give Zach and Lauren the opportunity to speak to questions you might have. Um, but now we want to go ahead and get to our third talk. Um, this last talk comes from Nathaniel Banks, an architectural and landscape designer with a certificate in urban geography. Gideon Liu is an architectural designer and an American Institute of Architects, New York State scholar. Tanner Egert, Egert is, a, apologies, uh, is a third year graduate student in the Department of Chemistry at Princeton University. Their talk is Project Plastic, Removing Microplastics from Urban Rivers. I'll turn it over to you all. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nathaniel, and I'm going to be uh, representing my group, uh, Project Plastic, um, which is an uh, organization that aims to remove plastic pollutants from rivers. Uh, so let me just share my screen. Uh, I can get the video up. Waterborne plastic waste is now a global concern, with potentially harmful discarded plastic fragments contaminating almost all coastal and marine ecosystems. Our initiative, Project Plastic, investigates the scalar disparity of plastic pollution and aims to develop technologies and infrastructure that can address plastic pollutants at their most extreme scales. While the extent and severity of plastic pollution is widely known, very little has been done to address the vast quantities of plastic present in the world's waters. What makes aquatic plastic so difficult to manage are the ways in which plastic pollutants simultaneously interact with the environment at both a macroscopic 
and microscopic scale. On a macro scale, plastics carried into the oceans by rivers are then transported by currents into five colossal plastic patches. The largest of these patches is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch that spans over an area three times the size of France. On a micro scale, plastic fragments within the oceans degrade into smaller and smaller pieces until they become what are called microplastics. Microplastics are classified as particles smaller than 5 mm in diameter and consist of fragments, fibres, films and pellets that are highly pervasive and almost invisible to the naked eye. Due to their small size, microplastics can be easily ingested, introducing toxic and carcinogenic chemicals into the diets of aquatic wildlife and humans. And with microplastic concentrations in water on the rise, governments, scientists and the general public are becoming very worried about the potential hazards in our water and seafood. The extreme disparity between the minute scales of plastic pollutants and their colossal areas of contamination makes it challenging for humans to adequately comprehend, let alone manage. Our initiative's goal is to consolidate these plastic pollutants from their extreme scales of operation into one that is more perceptible and manageable by humans. And to achieve this goal, we are developing new technologies for the extraction and long-term managed storage of aquatic plastic pollutants. The first of these technologies is the world's only portable, affordable and environmentally friendly riverborne microplastic collection device that we call the Plastic Hunter. The Plastic Hunter is a water treatment wetland pad that makes use of plant root networks as a biofilter to organically capture microplastics from rivers. Each pad consists of a fiberglass frame to protect the pads from fast currents and a removable porous membrane for inserting plant species and supplying them with essential nutrients. Over the summer, our team has worked hard to design and fabricate our first miniature prototype of the Plastic Hunter that we plan to pilot later this year. Maintenance and operation of the Plastic Hunter is mostly passive and can be described in the following steps. The Plastic Hunter is initially deployed in a polluted river with fresh plants. Over time, microplastics adhere to the plant roots until they eventually saturate. Upon saturation, a maintenance team will remove the saturated plant pad, using a fine net underneath the pad to prevent microplastics from re-entering the river, and a new clean pad will be installed, the existing frame for new plants to grow upon. Contaminated plant matter will then be processed and isolated, removing the microplastics from the broader environment. To showcase how plant roots can sequester microplastic, we experimented with homegrown duckweed. As seen here, roots can exude a gelatinous film that can entrap small sediments like microplastics. To more clearly illustrate how effectively aquatic plants and their roots can capture microplastics, we used water lettuce and UV fluorescent polyethylene beads with a diameter between 100 and 500 micrometers. The particles brightly fluoresce when illuminated with UV light and can easily be tracked with the naked eye. It's abundantly clear that the amount of freely circulating plastic particles decreases significantly after just a few hours. As seen, the plastics aggregate on the underside of the leaves and in the roots. The plastics remain adhered to the plants when removed from the tank. Moving forward, we will experiment with a variety of aquatic plant species to see which most effectively sequester plastics microplastic types to determine whether certain ones are more efficiently captured than others, and flow rates and other water conditions to evaluate how effective our system is under a variety of river conditions. Eventually, we will conduct experiments with the complete prototype model both under laboratory conditions and in the field. With plants tightly ordered in the pad unit, a dense network of underwater roots is created that can entrap microplastics without disturbing aquatic wildlife. With the pad's catamaran-style design, water flow is directed underneath the pad rather than around it, which should improve the capture efficiency in natural systems. These pads will be deployed in strategic locations throughout a river system. At each location, arrays of pads will be staggered along the river so as not to disrupt river traffic. In order to achieve maximum efficiency, the pads will need to be clustered together in dense arrays. We envision multiple possibilities for achieving this. 
one such strategy is to loosely tether the pads together and tether the array to the riverbank so the pads may move freely with the river current but still remain in a tight geometric configuration. Over the last couple months, our team has won several awards, which helped fund us to fabricate and test our first set of build prototypes. We're now planning to conduct a pilot run in Real River by the end of the year, and we're actively looking for public crowdfunding, corporate sponsorships, and municipal river contracts to launch our device. Our ultimate vision is to use our technology to motivate river authorities across the world's 10,000 most polluted rivers to seriously assess the problem of microplastics. In doing so, we hope that many will develop innovative and sustainable infrastructure for river plastic management. To demonstrate this vision, we studied many rivers and chose to implement a conceptual intervention along the mouth of the Alley River, which is the most polluted river in the U.S. Our site is at the now derelict eastern flank of the Alley Port. We began our intervention by redirecting the flow of the Alley River through our site. To slow down the flow of water, we split the river into a series of smaller streams, forming an artificial delta. In order to sequester the larger plastic sediments, we designed a compact collection center to the north of the site. The vast majority of the site, however, was transformed into an artificial wetland designed to sequester the most pervasive and smaller microplastic sediments that cannot be filtered efficiently from the water. To the south, we will deploy a massive array of our plastic hunter devices to capture microplastics, which will be securely composted on site. Once plant materials become saturated with microplastics, drones can be deployed to transport contaminated biomatter into the center of each island, forming a composting mound. To the north of the site, the plastic processing plant collects, sorts, and converts large river plastic sediments into compressed plastic panels. The northern structures use existing systems of river plastic sequestration and sorting to produce bales of relatively pure plastic base materials. These bales are then converted into structural plastic panels that are used to construct the enclosure of the collection center itself. The process of constructing these panels is very simple, and we were able to experiment in creating our own prototype panel with household equipment and plastic waste. Gathered plastics were shredded, melted, and then molded to form a dense panel that is malleable when heated, but sturdy when at room temperature. Our structures envision the creation of massive corrugated panels of compressed plastic to be used to form structural architectural enclosures. The aim in doing this is to be purposefully excessive and inefficient in our material usage, so that more plastics can be stored within the thickness of the structure. Continual lamination of these panels will force the structure to expand over time, becoming a physical record of the amount of plastic flowing in the Valley River. As societies gradually transition away from plastics towards less harmful alternatives, we anticipate the growth of the site to stagnate, transforming it into an artifact of bygone plastic consumption, all the while locking away plastics within the thickness of the city. Okay, um, and as a final note, we are currently in the process of uh, trying to set up a Kickstarter later this year. Uh, so please stay tuned to any updates we have. Uh, feel free to subscribe below to our site uh, for any further information. Thank you. So that's three great presentations we've just had the uh, privilege to, to watch. Um, We've got a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A. So I'm just, uh, as uh, for, for folks that are still there, um, uh, make sure that you um, uh, keep dropping questions either in the Q&A uh, or a chat and, and Autumn will help me uh, draw, draw my attention to that if there's there. Um, so I think that this first question might be for Lauren and Zach. Um, any plans to determine or monitor microplastics in macroinvertebrate tissue and or fish tissue? 
Um, right now, our focus is strictly on the microplastics in the water column, but that is definitely a future direction that we've thought of um, in the fish and the invertebrates. And also, one of our sample locations has a pretty um, large um, area of legacy sediment because there used to be a dam. So we've also tossed around um, sampling sediment cores there to see what like historical microplastic sample or um, microplastics look like in the sediment um, going back a few hundred years. But right now, strictly everything is on the water column um, in the creeks that we're studying. Okay, um, also from uh, 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 Tally for, I think again, this is for Zach and Lauren, any actions that can be taken based on these microplastic results? Uh, the conductivity, well, let's stop there because there's a, another conductivity monitoring um, piece to Tally's question there, but let's stop with any actions that can be taken based on these microplastic results. And maybe that's something that our third presentation wants to chime in on as well. Yeah, I think it's pretty appropriate that that was a question um, that led into the project plastic one. But for us in our headwaters, our main focus is to um, just let the people who live within the headwaters of the Darby, um, Ridley and Crumb Creeks kind of be more aware of where their plastic is going and not to litter. Cause as you know, the plastics can break down into the microplastics. Um, and then when we get large, rainstorms like we're getting today that can all wash into the waterways and um, pose a lot of threats to the wildlife there. Um, another thing is in the headwaters, there's plenty of people who have septic tanks. Um, so just ensuring that septic tanks are not malfunctioning um, and leaking wastewater into the creeks um, unknown is a big thing that you can do to just ensure plastics aren't getting in there. Um, and then at the trust, we really emphasize conserving land. Um, and that also just goes a long way and kind of reducing pollutants that are flowing into the stream. Um, so it can kind of slow the plastic that's flowing in and also just have less, um, I guess it'll slow the floodwaters flowing in as well during floods, um, maybe catching microplastics or maybe not, but um, conserving land always can go a long way in stopping and helping our streams. So, yeah. So how about the project plastic team? Do you want to weigh in on that as well? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I, I would say that our entire venture is about trying to figure out what can be done, what are the actions we can take. So um, obviously some of the stuff we presented is very early conceptual stuff, very far out. But in the short term, we think we can definitely start by once we know exactly how many plastics are in these waters, we can target specific rivers and then uh, try and apply devices like the Plastic Hunter that we've developed to sort of see if we can remove these things from uh, from the watershed. Um, but I, I'd like to emphasize that, that, you know, the work that sort of Zach's group is doing is highly important because one thing that's really not known is accurately how much plastic are in these rivers. And without that, we can't actually determine whether our device should be deployed or not. So it's very important either way, even just to know. So, um, and I mentioned, I, I heard you say in the, in the presentation um, that you had your conceptual design was um, looking at um, a river out west. Um, but just wanting to make sure that you've probably seen that study that came out about the Delaware River is one of the rivers dumping the most plastic pollution into the, the ocean. So um, wondering if since that conceptual, if, if depending on where in that concept um, ha and have you considered maybe looking if you're going to implement your concept, have some maybe given where you're located, is it perhaps changing your mind about where you might want to implement that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think the, that that concept that was being developed, uh, the reason why we did it on uh, the LA River was one at the time when we did it, it was what was known to be the, the most polluting, uh, but also because they were planning on actually uh, already changing that, uh, the mouth of the river into a park anyway. So we thought we might as well tag along into that. Um, but it's far more convenient for us to experiment and develop, you know, even at a small scale, more locally, because we're all based in Princeton, uh, the Delaware River's right there. It's perfect for us. So we'd love to expand and explore uh, applying our technology more locally. Um, and one of the questions that I had was, so there, there's a couple of different phases to your, the whole concept. There's multiple directions, um, like for example, the in-stream piece um, it, that can be deployed independently. It doesn't need necessarily the other larger plastic catching piece as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that so, go ahead. No, just uh, yeah, go, just go ahead. I just, I'll have, but I have a follow up when you get done. Oh, okay. Well, I've just, yeah, so the, the way we've designed it is that, you know, uh, we have this grand ambition of, of making these giant centers or these, these infrastructure that can actually 
you know, tackle all scales of plastic. Um, but we, we figured we'd focus on the one that's really not being addressed, which are microplastics, because there really isn't a system there that can do that, uh, that can really just remove it from our rivers. Um, so that, that's where we decided to start off. And we also think it's probably the most affordable and scalable component of, the, of our concept that we've decided to develop. Uh, and so, you, oh, so go ahead. Add, sorry, I want to add on to it a little bit. So uh, we are actually working in, um, in paired with the existing uh, water uh, river barriers, such as you see a lot of those nets that can actually stop big plastic from, from um, entering the ocean. So uh, if the river is very polluted, actually it makes sense to run through that filter first. So smaller pieces go into our device. So our pad doesn't get saturated too quickly. Thank you for sharing that. That's, um, that's helpful to know. Um, I, I just want, I'm wanting to make sure that you said you're going to have information about a, a Kickstarter um, and, and Project Plastic. It sounds like that's someplace where people can go to find that information. If someone wanted to reach out to you and say, hey, we'd love to pilot this when you get to that point on a waterway that we're working on, um, again, you're, you're available like through Project Plastic. People can reach you there that way, right? Yes, yes. Uh, we've literally just set up the site now and we've uh, we've got a subscription list. So if you just send us any information through there, we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. OK, um, there's another question here. Um, uh, Tali had mentioned that the conductivity monitoring seemed to have an action, uh, apply less salt, um, use other approaches. Um, I know we still haven't uh, got Elizabeth with us here, but perhaps um, David or Patty, um, do you want to speak to like there is an action there and it seems simple. Um, but somehow it doesn't seem like that, you know, that action seems like applying less salt is something we all know um, should happen, but it isn't necessarily happening. Maybe you can speak to some of the barriers to applying less salt and, and, um, and maybe what else Elizabeth is going to do to try to promote this information and about the need to do that. Yeah, I can say a little bit um, to begin with and Patty can add on if she'd like. Um, I mean, the main, the main uh, obstacle, I guess, to applying less salt is simply safety. Um, and I think there's certainly ways around that Elizabeth touched on um, better planning and more strategic assessment of really how much needs to be applied and uh, getting that information to the people who are applying. Um, certain states are doing better than others with that. Maryland has, has been working on it pretty diligently and has some really well built out models on um, that can be used for guiding actual amounts for application. But there's other methods. Uh, Elizabeth pointed out the um, geothermal resources that Westchester University is currently using. Um, they're testing it out on sidewalks right now where they're bringing uh, warm water up from the ground and thawing sidewalks that way. So there's no, no even need there to apply salt. There's also mechanical um, options such as these so-called live edge plows that are um, have much better contact with road surfaces. So there's a lot <clears throat> more efficient removal of ice and snow. And then there's certainly brining that can be done very strategically, um, which uses less and is a little bit more effective at um, kind of thawing in a purposeful way. Um, We'll see where Elizabeth goes with it. She's um, in the midst of a lot of stuff going on to college and um, schoolwork and um, sports and everything else that goes on with being a high school student. But uh, hopefully she pursues this in the future and into college and we'll see where she goes with it. She's made a lot of progress on this and provided some really good information. So um, I don't know if Patty has anything else to say. Uh, no, I think you. I think you recovered what I what I would have said. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. Okay, um, we have a question from from uh, Karen. Um, how will you know? So this is Project Plastic. How will you know when the plant roots become saturated with microplastics? Um, I mean, th this is something we're like really concerned about at the moment. So. Part of uh, what we're doing is we're experimenting at the moment with different microplastic levels, uh, different types of plant roots and different flow rates. And basically, we obviously, if, if there's more plastic in a river, 
it'll saturate faster and it'll need to be replaced more frequently. So we're trying to determine at the moment how quickly it is that they do saturate. And we've been doing experiments, which uh, I'm sure Tanner can elaborate on, um, which basically show a point where we've realized, you know, these things can only absorb so much and they need to be swapped. Um, but once again, this ties very much into a lot of the other work that's been presented today, which is that figuring out how polluted a river is will be in instrumental in us figuring out how often we need to uh, replace these pads. Thank yeah, you. I don't really have too much to add to that. It would really be just a combination of data that we get from our in-house experimentation, as well as our uh, pilot studies in the field, along with knowing, you know, what levels of contamination combined with flow rates of these different rivers. Um, so we, it would sort of be um, a, bit of, a bit of extrapolation at first until we got some really solid data from our field tests to sort of tell us how often these things were saturating and whether or not the plants were actually dying um, before they were reaching a saturation level. So uh, there's a lot more experimentation to be done. We are still very early stage um, and sort of just demonstrating proof of concept that this idea does work. Um, but yeah, it largely will be a, a combination of real data from the field along with our laboratory tests. Thank you. Um, we have another question here um, that I think kind of goes to again to a couple of different um, presentations from Michelle. It's wonderful to see the technical side of these issues and solutions. Are any of you working with behavioral scientists to address the human factor, the need for behavioral change in any of these? Um, well, I, I can speak for our end. Uh, so, so far, um, we haven't. We've been working, you know, purely in trying to figure out whether this technology works because we're very early stage. But I, I do think that it is very instrumental that people actually just, you know, they, they dump less in the rivers, they, but they dump less generally and they use less plastics generally. Um, a lot of this can also, that there's a limit though in terms of how, how much we can change behavior because uh, we found out recently that, you know, a lot of plastics are coming from tire fragments of cars that are just, you know, washing into the river. It's very passive. So there's only so much that, you know, behavioral change will really uh, control these plastics on a, on a large scale. Um, but one thing we're hoping to do is try and raise awareness of this issue as well, because I think, you know, people aren't going to invest in new technologies or change uh, to alternatives that are more environmentally friendly unless they're aware of the problem and uh, potentials on how to solve it. So that's one aspect we're really trying to get into. Yeah, I can speak for the trust. Um... But a lot of, we haven't worked with any behavioral scientists um, on this issue, but we have kind of provided resources for people in our program area or anyone that like frequents the trust preserves or even the websites um, on how to kind of go into a lower plastic lifestyle and like things that they can do to kind of change their behaviors. Um, but I think Nathan kind of highlighted it beautifully because a lot of these sites are near roads or in urban areas um, and stuff will just wash in passively as he was saying. So. There's, there's like an interesting balance, but um, I think on our end, we're just focusing on using the platform that we currently have um, and the resources that we currently have to kind of, one, understand what is in the water, but two, kind of let people know what we're seeing and um, small things they can do to change, but no, no behavioral scientists right now. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Lauren. Um, wants to know for the Project Plastics team, Project Plastic team, um, if you use microplastics with a biofilm or just raw mi microplastics on your study of root accumulation? Um, yeah, I can take this. Um, so the plant roots actually take quite a while to develop that gelatinous film and different plants appear to produce different levels of this gelatinous film. Um, currently, our studies have only used uh, very fresh plants that have come in. They haven't sat around in the tank long enough to really accumulate this film. Um, and the plastic particles themselves are not specially coated with anything. They're just polyethylene beads that are um, very, very small. Um, and so the accumulation that you're seeing is, I would say, for lack of a better term, raw, um, in the sense that it's just an uncoated, untreated plastic bead with, um, you know, plants that are very fresh that have none of this sticky gelatinous film on them. So we imagine that if we use plants, which we intend to do, uh, that have sat around for a while and accumulated this, um, you know, this growth of, um, you know, this gelatinous film, this exudate, that uh, the accumulation would be even higher. Thank you. Um, I had a, a, a question, um, I don't know if it's a comment or a question for Project Plastic, um, that there is sort of this element of um, memorializing this thing that we've been doing for such a long time with the structure, the concept that you have um, sort of as, you know, if you were to implement this, um, that in a way it's, it's um, that sort of this, this concept of uh, memorializing we did this terrible thing for such a long time that's had this 
um, impact on the environment and that there's sort of there's something on the landscape that would stand there as a as a reminder um, to think about how we uh, how we how we make decisions about how we use our resources and treat our waters. Um, was that sort of a conscious um, planning process that there be some sort of um, message in mm. in the system that you developed? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, EDN and myself are both uh, from an architectural background, and we we love romanticizing structures and buildings and tried to build narratives within them. And I think that was definitely an aspect we wanted to do was to not just make it that, oh, we've collected these plastics, we've turned them into building materials, and then we just spread them out throughout the city. Instead, we wanted to like nucleate it as sort of a monument to show the scale of which, you know, how much plastics we're consuming and how much are entering the oceans. Um, and it's, you know, I think that's tying again, once, uh, once again, to the idea of raising awareness of the problem and the scale of it, because um, as we sort of I tried to highlight in our presentation, uh, one of the big issues is people don't even know how big of a problem this is because the particles are so fine and they're spread over such a large area. So by condensing it in one space, you can really see that scale. Um, it's obviously a bit of a, a, a romantic project or one that's a bit, uh, you know, more uh, conceptual. Um, but we do definitely think we'd love to carry on aspects of that in whatever we do develop in the future. So uh, we're, we're coming up on the last few minutes. I'm gonna have one more question and then I'd like to try maybe just a real quick lightning round, just give each of our presenting teams just a, um, um, maybe a minute to maybe um, say uh, last words of wisdom for our, our audience today. So the last question would be for um, Zach and Lauren, just sort of wondering, sort of goes to this um, behavioral science aspect of this, um, the idea of um, if, you were looking at bringing volunteers in to assist with the project and whether or not um, uh, uh, whether or not um, that um, changes behaviors at all. Um, you can chime in too if you want to, but um, right now it is just, I guess, the watershed team at the trust, but there's been conversation to kind of bring, I guess, other people in to sample at other locations. Um, but I think something that's kind of difficult with microplastics is they're so small and they're so hard to see with the naked eye that kind of just collecting them. Um, and unless you're physically analyzing them, you don't really interact with them too much or see them. Um, whereas like when you're out um, in a stream or I guess in an area with a lot of plastic, you kind of see that. and you know, um, it kind of hits you in a way of like, this is a lot of pollution, but with microplastics, it, you don't really see it. So um, I think microplastic wise, unless you're like actually analyzing it um, under a microscope or using other methods, you're not really gonna be shocked in a way um, to wanna change your behavior in a way that like, I think macroplastics and like bottles and everything like that would. Um, I don't know if Lauren, if you wanna add anything to that, but that's just what my thoughts are on this. Yeah, Zach, I think I think you you hit it pretty solidly there that there's right there's a limit to how much behavioral change we can enact and you know reports have come out about eating a credit cards worth of microplastics a month. Um, and, and those sorts of shocking and unnerving figures are effective up to a point, um, but I think that there is a lot of. Um, responsibility right to be placed still on the producers and so we need to have this kind of two forked approach to reducing microplastics not only individual changes but also production change um, and more of a cradle to grave approach of, of plastic in our environment um, so I'm, I'm so encouraged by all of the work i've seen today it's really really cool to to see these kind of more engineering focused approaches and using that biology and engineering aspect um to to start to really address the the wide scale kind of incomprehensible scale of of the plastic conundrum that we find ourselves in thanks lauren so this, let's quickly just go around if there are any last words from any of our presentations team um, yeah, I mean, I guess uh, some final thoughts are just that I'm really impressed with what I've been seeing from everyone else. It's really inspiring to see all this research and everyone's doing. And um, I think it's it's actually opened up a lot of doors for potential collaboration, which I'm, I'm looking forward to potentially doing with some of these people. Um, yeah. 
and yeah, I guess one last thing is we do have that Kickstarter coming up. So please uh, sign up for our, 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 our newsletter at uh, projectplastic.website uh, um, or email us at info at projectplastic.site. Uh, yeah. So I'm afraid it's time to wrap up. Uh, and I want to thank all of our speakers once again for taking the time to share their research and experience with us during the Watershed Congress presentations. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>